Welcome, and thank you all for joining us today for our Monash Prato Dialogue Distinguished Lecture Series in Artificial Intelligence. I'm Professor Joanna Batstone, the Director of the Monash Data Futures Institute, and I will be your host and moderator today. We're also joined today by many of my colleagues from the Monash Data Futures Institute, the largest interdisciplinary community of AI and data science thought leaders across Asia Pacific. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are gathered today, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Welcome to the 2022 series of Monash Prato Dialogue Distinguished Lectures in Artificial Intelligence. In this series, we aim to explore the evolving impact of data science and AI in society by fostering a global dialogue. Launched last year in 2021, this Distinguished Lecture Series takes its name from Monash University Center in Prato, Italy, that represents an international base for research, education, intellectual and cultural exchange, and enables us to bring people together to meet, learn, and collaborate with peers and colleagues from around the world. Please also join us on social media by following us on Twitter at MonashDFI and by using the hashtag Monash Prato Dialogue. You've joined us today for the sixth lecture in this series and the first for 2022, where we're pleased to host Dr. Maria Rosaria Tadeo. Dr. Tadeo is the Associate Professor and Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute at Oxford University. And she's the Defense Science and Technology Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. Dr. Tadeo has received multiple awards, including the 2010 Simon Award for Outstanding Research in Computing and Philosophy, the 2016 World Technology Award for Ethics, and her research has been published in major journals, including Nature, Nature Machine Intelligence, Science, and Science Robotics. In 2018, Inspiring 50 named her the most inspiring 50 Italian women working in technology. And in 2020, she was also named as one of the 12 Outstanding Rising Talents by Women's Forum for Economy and Society. In today's lecture, Dr. Tadeo will present principles and recommendations to support a governance strategy to leverage the opportunities offered by AI for the climate crisis in a responsive, evidence-based, and ethically sound manner. Enough introductions from me. We're delighted to introduce our speaker now, um, over to you, Maria Rosaria, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Joan. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for having me, and good evening to everybody. Uh, there's a bit of a time difference between uh, the speaker and the audience today, but I'll do my best um, to, to make sure that it doesn't show that the year is quite early in the morning. Uh, so let me just start by trying to uh, share my screen. Uh, hopefully you, you can see it. Um, so as Joanna said, I, uh, I would like to use the time that we have today to um, discuss and present um, issues, uh, but also solutions, hopefully, um, to leverage the power of AI um, uh, to support actions against the climate crisis or to foster uh, sustainability. Um, and I'll take AI to be uh, a case uh, that can teach us lessons as to how to leverage the power of the digital to support uh, sustainability throughout. Before beginning, I should say that uh, the work I'm going to present today is being developed uh, over the past few years uh, with a fantastic research team, uh, including students at the University of Oxford, Josh and Luciano, and a colleague, um, uh, sorry, Josh and Andreas, and a colleague, uh, Luciano, all working together at the Oxford Internet Institute. So, um, we have a bit of time, but uh, uh, I will be focusing on only a few things which I think are relevant in this context when considering AI and sustainability. The first has to do with the way AI is conceived uh, or should be conceived uh, in, this, in this domain. There's been a lot of um, hype about AI technologies. Uh, we've seen it at the beginning of the pandemic as well, when uh, many people turned or looked at AI as to something that would lead or take us to the solution to this massive problem that the pandemic was. And while AI has been a powerful tool um, supporting research during the pandemic, and while AI is a powerful tool supporting um, actions against the, kind of the climate crisis or the development of uh, sustainability policies and approaches, it is not a magic wand. 
uh, it has a lot of potential. It also has, it also has um, a lot of uh, potential for risk uh, and uh, unwanted outcomes. So we need to kind of understand this space to be able to navigate it. Um, once we have mapped a little bit problems and uh, uh, options and opportunities, um, I shall focus on a specific case, um, which has to do with the environmental impact of AI itself, the carbon footprint of AI, and I'll focus on a specific case study that we developed um, last year. And by then, uh, I think we will have uh, all relevant information and evidence to consider some policy recommendation as to how to leverage the power of AI for um, sustainability. So uh, let's start with the use of AI to fight the climate change. Uh, this is something that has become quite uh, common around the globe. Um, I live in the UK, but I'm European, so I, I always look at policies and approaches developed by the European Union. Um, and it was actually quite interesting to see a couple of years ago, the Council of the European Union accepting a conclusion which encouraged the Commission um, to make the European Union carbon neutral by 2050 by leveraging digital solutions to enhance the environmental protection and climate action. Now, in, in Europe, they have developed this strategy called the Twin Transition, where they combine uh, exactly approaches uh, driven by digital technologies to policies um, aiming at sustainability and uh, improving environmental condition. And it makes a lot of sense to do so. It makes a lot of sense for many reasons, but one is particularly relevant to me because it's a conceptual reason. Our societies are digital societies. This is not uh, news to anybody, at least anybody <laughs> connected to this webinar today, to this lecture today. Um, and there are many implications to, uh, for, from this uh, premise. One is of a particular relevance to what we're discussing here today, because digital societies are societies which um, depend on digital technologies to function and prosper, but there are also societies that in doing so generate a lot of data and they have an infrastructure to collect, curate and analyze this data. And this actually enables AI to do a wonderful work in extracting irrelevant information. So when it comes to sustainability and more specifically to fight climate change, AI can be a great help to predict climate change itself, uh, but also to, for example, improving performances as of performances of electric grids, uh, to facilitate policy actions insofar as it can help us extract information about the environment, about societies, and so improve intervention. And indeed, there is a, a report from um, PwC and Microsoft that shows or estimates that the use of AI for the environment can lead to uh, the reduction of um, greenhouse gases up to 4%, while also boosting GDP up to 4.4%. So there is a lot of uh, good potential in this, uh, in this context. And there's a good potential that um, also the academic community has recognized, studied and mapped. Um, this paper from uh, Rolnik, for example, shows that for the many domains in which we might want uh, to have positive actions for, for the environment or sustainabilities. And the domains range from improving electricity systems to um, societal impact as in ecology, improving infrastructures and social systems to education and finance. Well, for all these domains, there is at least one kind of AI technology that can be of support. And as you can see, uh, the, the, the metrics here is um, quite, uh, let's say, giving a good message in terms of how we can leverage AI for um, sustainability or environmentally good solution. The point is that uh, despite its great potential, AI is not a magic wound. And there are two types of risks uh, that we need to consider when we think about uh, using AI for socially good outcomes, in this case, sustainability, and um, using AI uh, uh, for socially good outcomes more broadly. The two types of risks are uh, environmental and ethical, or better, ethical and environmental. I should focus on the ethical first and move to the environmental in a moment. At a high level of analysis, um, the risks, the ethical risks that AI poses when used for the purposes of sustainability can be mapped, mapped in terms of misuses, overuses, and underuses of AI. Uh, misuses and overuses, we're going to see it in a moment. They create risks which have to do with individual rights, with accountability, with breaching of trust of um, the general public, but also specific sets of kind of users. And the uses of AI are problematic in a different way, insofar as they create opportunity cost. The opportunity cost can be mapped both in terms of missed opportunities, but also in terms of using AI in a way uh, which is not ideal, is not optimal, and by doing so, missing the opportunities of using AI in the best or in the better, in the best or in, the, in a better way. 
So when we think about the use of AI uh, for uh, sustainability, we find ourselves in a specifically problematic situation, uh, which I have to say is quite common when we think about using AI for any uh, socially good um, outcome. Uh, we find ourselves very much in the situation of uh, Ulysses here in this uh, painting from Fuseli. This is U Ulysses who uh, navigates a rough uh, area um, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, the Sicilian Channel, where you have a narrow path and then a rock and a whirlpool. Uh, sea and Caribdis, uh, the two evils, and you need to be a really, really uh, skilled sailor to make sure that the boat is not sucked into the whirlpool or crashed into the, the rock. When considering AI uh, for sustainability, our uh, whirlpool and rock are the ethical risks on the one side and the missed opportunities on the other side. And we need a lot of um, skillful ethical thinking, skillful governance to be able to uh, navigate this, this, uh, this rough spot, so to speak. So what are the risks that we are considering when it comes to uh, AI and sustainability? These risks are not specific uh, yet uh, to the sustainability issue or area. They are kind of characterizing any use of AI uh, that we can imagine in our societies. Uh, now, this is a map we published in Science Robotics a few years ago, um, considering big categories of ethical risks that AI poses. I won't consider security for the purposes of this lecture today, but let's just focus on the blue or baby blue circles. Um, there are risks which have to do with human wrongdoing. We're all familiar by now with issues concerning bias and profiling and then using AI in ways which either drive or enhance or propagate um, prejudice in our societies and uh, undue discrimination. Um, and this has to do with both breaching individual rights uh, in terms of fair treatment and opportunities, but also what we call group rights. So categorizing individuals, putting individuals into black, black, big boxes, big categories, and treating them in an unfair way, independently of our ability to identify them as um, individuals. There are issues concerning reducing human control. Black box, again, is not a new problem anymore. Uh, but the idea that we rely on a technology which is used to make decisions which have impact on ourselves, our societies and the environment, that this remain a technology that we cannot display, but more importantly also that we cannot really predict with accuracy what outcomes it will lead us um, to. There is an issue of responsibility and human responsibility. Uh, I think there is a, a broad consensus in the academic community that AI systems cannot be held morally responsible for their own actions, human error, but then attributing this responsibility in a fair and justified way can be problematic because of the way AI systems are designed, developed, and then used. And then there is an issue with human skills. Um, uh, we heard in the past a lot of discussion about the uh, impact of AI on the job market. This is not what I'm referring here to. Uh, I'm referring more to the fact that the way, or the more we delegate tasks to AI, we need to, we risk to also give up the expertise to land or to perform that task ourselves. And why is it, is it okay, it is okay, I believe, to delegate the task. We also have to find ways to retain the expertise. Uh, to put it in a, with a trivial example, we still want doctor, doctors to be able to read an X-ray, uh, even if AI does the job 99% of the time, because otherwise we won't be able to know when the AI makes a mistakes or just stop functioning which is possible. And then we have another problem, which has, which has to do with our uh, autonomy or self-determination. Uh, you might remember the slide, one of the first slides I showed a few minutes ago about the uh, digital societies and how, how every aspect of our life is now mediated by digital, uh, digital technologies. AI is a particular instance of this technology because it's not just a tool, it is an agent which interacts with us in the environment and often mediates the actions and interactions between us and our environment. This mediation, uh, which often comes in forms of nudging, supporting, helping, uh, might uh, erode or take a little bit away or too much away from our abilities to make choice in an independent and autonomous way. These challenges come back when we look at um, AI for sustainability. Uh, issues having to do with individual and group rights uh, emerge quite clearly when we start thinking about data collection that we need to understand um, habits, consumptions, uh, the way some aspects of societies work. And so it's important that uh, we keep this in mind because not only the data collection, but the decisions that by, be, might be made uh, out of this uh, data analysis might lead to undue discrimination. 
the issue of self-determination is quite pressing uh, if we think about um, the possible use of AI technologies to not only understand how individuals behave, but also nudge more sustainable attitudes, habits, and behavior. At which point then nudging starts to become too much and the road self-determination is an important pressing ethical issue. And then there is an aspect which is gonna come back also later in this talk, which has to do with um, social and environmental justice as to how the distribution of this technology and the access to this technology, and so the access to the potential that this technology has to support sustainability is not really uh, homogeneous, uh, homogeneously distributed around the globe and how that um, poses issues of environmental and social justice. So it's not all bad, I should say. I, I don't like uh, ethical analysis and I try not to develop ethical analysis which only focus on problems. Uh, there is a lot of potential of AI, which is important to, to leverage. Um, so trying to understand which exactly is this potential and how to leverage it, a few years ago, we started um, a project in Oxford to understand how uh, AI and whether AI can support sustainable actions. And in particular, we looked at the um, SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And our project um, started with uh, the uh, collection of information about um, cases or uses of AI in support of the SDGs. We put together a database which is open uh, and available to everybody. Um, the, 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 the database has been put together and collecting data in a quite of us, in a kind of a strict way. We only included in it um, AI uh, project which supported actually uh, uh, one of the SDGs, uh, which were real life uh, concrete uh, projects relying on some form of AI, uh, which was a bit more than just a spreadsheet, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. We also included only projects which had been in the field for at least six months, uh, which had documented positive impact and about which there was no or minimal evidence of contraindication or negative side effect. We created this database and the analysis of the database was quite revealing uh, in terms of both the potential and problems. First of all, we noticed that um, there is at least one, or at the time, 2020, there was at least one initiative for of using uh, AI in support of SDGs. We also noticed, as you can see here, that there is a lot of disparities among the SDGs. It's not a surprise that uh, some SDGs, uh, especially those that focus on health uh, and healthcare, smart cities, um, uh, are more, uh, let's say, uh, centered on AIs than others. It is not a surprise because these are also the sectors where there might be more funding, there might be more interest from uh, public uh, funding institutions, but also um, private funding bodies. The other problems that emerged was uh, what we call the sustainability divide. Um, our databases focuses only on uh, cases reported or described in English, so there is a limitation in our methodology, but still it is quite revealing to see the uh, effort to develop or use AI for SDGs are not equally distributed across the globe. Uh, and there is uh, a, clear, uh, a clear divide there, which um, indicated there is an issue of, um, shall we say, technological injustice, which then might lead to environmental uh, breaches of environmental justice. So uh, it is clear of, for us at least, that uh, there is need for a coordinated governance or strategy, uh, either at the global or regional level, which is able to uh, drive funding, uh, research and uh, actions. Now, in order to understand in more details uh, what kind of funds, research and action should be taken there, we also wanted to explore a little bit what is the environmental impact of AI itself. Um, at the moment, AI represents only 1.4 uh, of the uh, green gas um, emission, greenhouse gases emission uh, of the old uh, ICT uh, domain, so to speak. But this um, this this data, this this percentage, might grow over the years, as we shall see in a moment. So we wanted to understand what are the problems with the environmental impact of AI. Uh, what is this environmental impact? How it can be mitigated, if it can be mitigated at all? And this takes us to um, the last. Um, part of, sorry, the second part of this, of this lecture, the specific case that we wanted to um, analyze. So we started off considering that uh, over the past 10 years, since basically uh, uh, 2012, the uh, computing power, the compute um, uh, necessary, <coughs> sorry, necessary to train state-of-the-art um, models for AI has 
grown quite uh, extensively. We now need, uh, it's grown 300, 3,000 times, uh, sorry, 300,000 times uh, over the past 10 years. Now, the growing of computing power needed to train AI uh, means that there is more energy demand, and this means that there are growing carbon emission. This is a big picture. We thought, okay, how can we um, explore this kind of uh, big picture in more details? And at the time, the GPT-3, uh, you might remember, this is a natural language processing um, uh, a model of AI, which enables translation, creation of text, uh, had, had been just released. And so we thought, okay, perhaps we can consider how much it costs in terms of um, green gas emissions to train just one run of a GPT-3 model. Uh, it is a calculation that is a little bit difficult to, to develop because um, there is not much, too much information that is shared by designers and developers about training conditions of AI, uh, of AI models and about other um, technologies that are needed to develop um, these models themselves. But um, using information about computing power, the kind of hardware that has been used to train GPT-3, making some plausible assumptions about other training conditions, and referring to uh, Lacoste um, and colleagues uh, Galbon Impact Calculator, we assessed that one single training run of a GPT-3 model um, would that produce 223,920 kilos of CO2? Uh, just to give you a reference, this is more or less what uh, 49 cars uh, in the US consume or produce in terms of CO2. So it's quite massive. And we should keep in mind that uh, usually um, developers and designers, uh, they train much more than one single uh, model uh, before uh, being able to publish a result. So, the potential impact of uh, training AI models um, is, quite, is quite high. And it's interesting to see how this calculation changes depending on or considering uh, the source or the geographical location of the training itself, because um, the data or the outcome would have been much bigger if we had considered, for example, Australia or South Africa or, or India, insofar as uh, energy is produced with different uh, environmental impact across the globe. So the picture starts to look a bit more uh, problematic because um, the, the case that we studied indicated that the increasing uptake of AI uh, across the globe uh, means that there is a growing need also the computing power needed to train state-of-the-art models. And this growth um, has been assessed as being 10, 10 times faster than the improving of performances of GPUs per, per energy consumption. And this is problematic for the way research is driven also in this, in this domain, insofar uh, as most of this research or research in the, in, in the AI domain is oriented to improve accuracy. Breakout accuracy are, uh, is one of the topics on which research is centered in this, in this area, which means that AI research uh, focuses much more on uh, developing accurate model to the detriment of uh, energy uh, efficiency. Uh, and this can become becomes clear if we uh, look, for example, uh, how much, how, what is the topic of papers published or presented at major uh, conferences in the area. This is uh, a chart um, taken from uh, a paper from Schwartz and colleagues. Um, they analyzed the sample of 60 papers, and the graph here shows the proportion of papers focusing on accuracies, accuracy of AI models um, versus efficiency, or the proportion of papers which focus on both efficiency and accuracy. The red uh, spiking columns here, they tell us how much the focus is on accuracy versus efficiency, for example, and this is problematic. Uh, this poses question uh, with respect to at least two issues. The where and the how AI is developed as something that starts to have an important uh, impact on the sustainability of AI itself, and as something that perhaps should be considered more carefully when thinking about governance of AI for sustainability. The where, uh, AI is developed as issues or implications for environmental justice. Because it is true that devices and hardware are being developed to improve energy efficiency of AI models, but it is also true that, or it is quite unclear, that um, this improvement might not be uh, keeping pace with the usage uh, of computing power to develop this, uh, this technology. And it is also unclear uh, whether new hardware and more efficient hardware and devices might be available geographically in the same way uh, across the globe. Um, and this means that it is possible to conceive a future where, or even a present, where 
AI research is driven by, by well-resourced team um, working in developed countries and thus exacerbating environmental justice. And this has been reported already, for example, in a paper by Perot and colleagues. Um, they mapped or assessed the number of deep learning papers um, uploaded on Archivix and per region. And you can see that between 2015 and 2018, there's been a growing research in areas like uh, North America, Europe, Central Asia, whereas other areas are still not producing as much research as uh, you could possibly imagine on uh, the development of AI. It is problematic as we uh, see the digital uh, AI specifically, but the digital more broadly as a technology which leads uh, developing of not only economy, but also research, science, societal welfare. Uh, and so the lack of research uh, in some region of the world is problematic, not just for the research itself, but for the missed opportunity that this represents for societies. Um, and then there is the other issue, which has to do with the way research is developed within the community. Uh, it has to do with the uh, so-called reproducibility crisis. Most of the information about the way AI models um, are designed, trained, uh, is not shared because of the commercial interest, because there, is no, there are no incentives or requirements to do so. This means that <coughs> if a um, group of researchers wants to reproduce some results presented by colleagues somewhere else, they need to start from scratch, so to speak. And of course, this creates um, or doubles the cost uh, for the environment. To, uh, to develop AI or to design and develop AI system and models from scratch um, to fill the information gaps that could be actually uh, not be there if more information were shared about designing and training um, conditions. And this is also an impact again on the, um, the environmental justice and social justice insofar as um, uh, scientists working in uh, uh, developing countries or less rich countries will find, will have more obstacles in uh, achieving their own results. So where does this take us in terms of ethical and governance considerations? It's not really a binary uh, situation that we face here. It's not really uh, either all good or all bad. The use of AI for sustainability for the environment uh, is something that can be done. I would argue in a moment that it should be done, but it can only be done, it should only be done if we're able to reach um, some kind of ethical trade-off, which are complex because we need to harmonize and balance different principles, different values, different rights, different interests, which are not necessarily um, inconsistent or incompatible, but might be competing one with the other. So there is need for uh, a lot of ethical thinking, which hopefully will be able to underpin effective and successful um, governance um, strategies. We have to keep in mind that AI is something that has a huge, potentially a huge impact on, on the environment, negative impact on the environment, that can also be used to develop and perform tasks which could uh, otherwise take uh, up a lot of resources in terms of time, human efforts, and potential even electricity. So it's a matter of having a strategy and a vision of how to use AI, where to use AI, and how to compensate these risks. And this takes me to the last part of um, this presentation, the policy uh, recommendation. The policy recommendations are targeted uh, not just to policymakers, as you will see, but also to the research and scientific community. I take governance as something which has to do with um, strategy and vision, a strategy and vision which uh, should, in the case of a specific case that we discussed today, uh, be grounded on um, an understanding of the ethical risks that we have there and possibly being able to mitigate um, those, risk, those risks. And, and so in this context, there are three uh, sets of um, suggestions that I would like to stress. The first is that We've learned this the hard way for all the mistakes we've done in, when, when developing and using AI in the past 10 years. But there is a constant friction. There is a constant pressure that the use of this technology puts on individuals, individual and group rights. Uh, while these rights are not, abs are not uh, absolute in the sense that they don't come in a binary way, it's not that you have or you don't have privacy, they are fundamental. They cannot be taken away from us, but they can be modulated. They can be harmonized with other rights which might be competing. We have seen this in the course of the pandemic, for example, where our right to privacy has uh, been uh, sometimes uh, confronted, so to speak, or harmonized with our right to health and public health and, and the right to um, health care. So it's about understanding where the balance is. But it's important that we have clear the need 
of understanding this balance and then we find ways of implementing it correctly. The risk is otherwise that um, we we'll miss the opportunity of using AI for sustainability because individuals were rejected uh, and societal rejection of technology means hampering uh, uh, the possibilities of leveraging its potential for good outcomes. There is an issue of values uh, which sh should, should underpin governance of AI for socially good outcomes, particularly for sustainability. Uh, the benefit of using this technology for environmental purposes must be set against the societal and geographical asymmetries, uh, because these are felt more frequently by severely poorer regions and parts of the world, and we, we should be able to use technology in a way to set these asymmetries or correct these asymmetries. And eventually strategies. Uh, AI as, or the use of AI for sustainability does not lead to the same uh, outcomes in all sectors. There are sectors in which uh, there could be greater green net gains than in other sectors where we might have severe rebound effect. Um, and I know we can conceive, for example, of, uh, the, 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 we can think about the fashion sector, where you could use AI to uh, improve uh, production, to improve, to reduce cost of production, to reduce cost of logistics and, and, and transportation. Um, and that would have a positive impact on the environment. But there could be also a strong rebound effort because in reducing this cost, one might uh, also push consumption and so increase demand and so increase production itself. And eventually the net gain, the net gain for the environment might be lower. So it is important that we understand which are the sector which will lead to a greater uh, uh, good impact for the environment and start to strategize investment and funding to support um, these, uh, these, these sectors of our societies. So with this vision in mind, uh, we uh, designed 14 recommendations. You don't have to read this, this is a slide just to show the recommendations. Um, they are uh, available in a paper and uh, which has been published last year and I have references at the end of the slide. Um, but the recommendations are shaped around kind of three, uh, three criteria, so I have three goals. Um, assessing existing capabilities, incentivize new approaches, but also maximize the potential of AI for climate change or versus climate change, but for sustainability, while minimizing the risks, both environmental and ethical. Uh, just to give you an, um, a bit more details on this recommendation, when it comes to uh, assessing what's there, the recommendations have been defined or designed to keeping the European Union in mind, but I think this is true for many other regions of, uh, of the world. There are a lot of initiatives, there are a lot of efforts um, to develop AI and coordinate research in AI that can be used then for um, sustainability, but there is lack of coordination. So it's important that we start moving in this, in this direction, coordinating the distributed resource, resources that we have. Uh, we refer, for example, to opensustain.tech um, uh, um, as a way or as a, an example of initiatives that foster collaboration and collaborative efforts, um, particularly in sharing resources, which is a key element here. And then there is uh, an issue of uh, incentivizing new approaches. The reproducibility crisis that we saw earlier, for example, uh, is something that can be overcome if we change the way in which um, information is shared about uh, developing of AI and is shared also, for example, among researchers in these academic communities. So it's important that we introduce new metrics and standards, for example, to for assessing the environmental, the environmental impact of these technologies, but also new requirements to report this impact. Uh, for example, when we submit papers to um, uh, conferences, journals, or where you know we we, we propose uh, research for for funds, and we should be able to uh, have metrics that allow to compare the environmental impact of different projects or um, different different research plans, and eventually uh, the need to mitigate uh, the possible ethical risks, uh, societal risks versus um, the um, need to use AI or the will to use AI to uh, fight climate change um, requires a little bit of a, an ethical strategy. Um, there's been a lot of work done by the uh, community working on digital ethics uh, in the past decade to understand problems, understand opportunities, consider way, considering way to uh, mitigate or resolve the problems. Um, it is time to implement them. It is time that we move from the principles to the practices. Uh, and it's time that we do that in a strategic way. For example, we know that we could develop um, protocols to audit the ethical impact of an AI uh, system and so understand where the problems are 
and mitigate them in time. Um, so starting to uh, think about how the use of AI for socially good outcomes, particularly AI for sustainability, also pose ethical risks and problems, <coughs> and strategize how these ethical risks and problems can be identified and mitigated and solved uh, through ethical strategies. Uh, and having governance to support these strategies is uh, fundamental to this end. And this takes me to my last slide. You might be guessing where I'm going. AI is a great, powerful tool that we have in our hands. Um, and it's a tool that I think we should be using to the best of our possibilities to meet all these difficult challenges that we face uh, at this moment uh, in time in history, whether it is the um, climate crisis, where it is using AI to um, improve uh, research in healthcare, to uh, improve improve the governance of our societies. There is a responsibility that we have towards the next generations, the post-digital societies, to leverage all this potential for socially good outcomes of AI. It would be tremendously missed opportunities if we did not uh, leverage this great potential. If, uh, going back to Ulysses, rather than trying to navigate this rough uh, patch of water, we turned our boat uh, the other way around. Um, so we have to do that. But we also have to keep in mind that AI is not the only tool in the drawer. The, there are many other tools. And more importantly, that to leverage this great potential, we need to have a great strategy, a strategy which has to do with the kind of societies we want to develop, societies that we want to develop not only in the next five years, but perhaps in the next 20 or 30 years, and how we can use this tool to that uh, end. And I'll stop here. I hope you find it uh, interesting, and I'm happy to uh, take any other questions, any questions you might have. Uh, before I go, um, these are the papers that we um, brought in the past couple of years on the topic of AI for sustainability. And these are the articles uh, from where I took uh, the three pictures that I show during the lectures. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria Rosaria. That was, was really fascinating and, and very thought provoking. And I think it's, um, it's a very interesting discussion. Often when we think about AI and the climate crisis, we immediately jump to a position that says, well, can I use AI to help me understand the impact of climate on bushfires? Or can I use AI to analyze satellite data that may help me show where a river is at risk of flooding? But I think you're, you're prompting a very different conversation, which is around, well, what is the impact on the environment and the impact on climate on even running those AI models and the increase in compute cost as impact on the environment puts a very different cost benefit analysis on the discussion around the environmental is, um, aspects of AI. So, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to move into a question and answer session now. And there are a couple of questions around this cost benefit analysis. And so there's a, so I'm going to go through a couple of questions and to the best of my ability, try to group them together in, in some thematic areas. Um, so this notion of, of cost and benefits, um, how do we model or how can we best model optimum scenarios of costs and benefits, right? So you've talked about the cost associated with running a model, but how do we actually model that model so that we can come up with some optimum scenarios for when it makes sense to, to leverage AI in the analysis of environmental impact? So in essence, how much of an environment, environmental impact are we willing to accept in return for a significant return to society? And this is a very important uh, question and the answer is a bit tricky because on the one side, side as a scientist or as a researcher, uh, I don't like the idea that you know, researchers should be bounded in what they do. You should, we should let creativity and research interest to, 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 to drive whatever we do in this, in this area. On the other side, uh, there is also an understanding of uses of AI, which can be more beneficial to societies than others. So I think that <coughs> there should be an assessment of, it's not an absolute measure, but there should be an assessment of what, could, what is the envisaged benefit for societies that we can have from this model. And so that kind of indicates the trade-off that we are willing to accept uh, in that sense. The other thing is that we can reduce the cost if we change the way we do research in this area. Uh, and so the problem becomes less pressing. If we can really share more information about how models are trained, if we can share data for the training of models, if we can stop having commercial interests driving 
the disclosure of the research, uh, that will be already a way of making these trade-offs much more acceptable and to leave research on AI free from any kind of from any constraints, while also mitigating the impact uh, on uh, on the environment. I know it's perhaps not a, a, def a definitive answer, but it's an answer that allows us not to put too many caps uh, on research in itself, which uh, I wouldn't like to, 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 to say it would be a great strategy in that sense. Yes, thanks. And so you made reference to commercial interests. There's, a, there's another question, perhaps a somewhat cheeky question here, um, that you made reference to a report about the benefits of AI to the environment from Microsoft and PwC. You've just mentioned commercial interests. Can we get an accurate sense of risks and benefits when those analyses and reports are actually coming from organizations who do benefit potentially commercially from the adoption of AI from these models and experiments? Well, I think that, you know, there, there is a conflict of interest and nobody is, is naive to think that it's not there. Uh, and one might dispute or might say, well, that's, that's not something we want to consider as a, a golden standard. But it is true, in, even if you don't want to go with the data provided by the DWC and Microsoft report, it is true that AI can improve uh, GDP because it can optimize resources, it can optimize understanding better the market, so you know, it improve better the, the whole production consumption uh, chain there. It is also true that AI can help us optimize these resources that we use and so reduce the environmental impact there. So I would say that feel free to discard the, the record, but the rationale seems to seems convincing to me. And, and perhaps that's one thing that I would like to stress that oftentimes we we we, we focus on it's gonna show that I have a, a Catholic upbringing, but we, we focus on the little bit of dust in the eye of the opponent and we forget the bigger picture here. So the bigger picture here is that indeed perhaps the, the private sector the private sector has a conflict of interest. But they're pointing, this report is pointing to an interesting trade-off. And the data might not be, uh, the percentages might, might not be as the one that they uh, show, but the trade-off is there. And we need to understand how to, to get there and how to, to leverage this situation, this potential. And I wanted to say one more thing, which might be mm, cheeky uh, on my side. But big tech, for all the problems that they pose and for all the, the faults that they have, they're also part of this picture. And they also, those who drive most of the interesting research in the development of AI. So we cannot think, thinking about post-digital societies and, and leveraging the potential of digital for, for social good outcome. We cannot think to leave them out of the picture. I don't think we can imagine a society where we leave them unregulated and free to do whatever they want to do. I think that we come to the point where we have to pose some boundaries and directions, but also, these are one of the major stakeholders. So it would be naive to think that we disregard whatever whatever they say and we go for our on our path. Um, so there is a bit of middle middle ground solution to be reached there. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, another question here with respect to the digital economy and the digital uh, potentially digital divide as well. Um, so AI is al already very scalable today. Um, AI impacts the lives of so many different people today in many, many different ways. But however, to what extent <coughs> is that very challenge, the fact that it is so available and so central to our lives today, um, is that central to the challenge of the sustainable use of AI? So in essence, right, if it wasn't so easy to do or so readily deployable, would we still be facing these challenges around the sustainable use of AI. So in essence, are we creating the self-fulfilling prophecy for ourselves? Prophecy. Because the easier it becomes, the more impact we have and the more negative impact we have because it's become so easy. Yeah, I mean, it's to some extent, yes. Uh, but there is also another picture. Is, uh, the climate change uh, and the sustainability, they, they pose complex problems. Uh, and we need all the tools that we possibly have and can have to address them. So, one could respond, well, if we forget about AI, we're going to be set 20 or 30 years back into the fight uh, uh, against climate change and climate crisis. How do we deal with that, this issue there? I think that the whole point is to try to reduce the environmental impact of AI itself. 
Uh, and there are many ways, and most of these ways are not complicated at all because they, the problems emerge from the way we have developed AI so far, not from AI itself. And to make access, to give access to this technology as broadly as possible, because the other thing we don't want to end up is a world where you have part of it able to meet the, 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 the challenge of sustainability and another part pay the cost of it without any, any access to the benefits. So yes, it is, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy only if we mismanage it. But, uh, and if it will be that case, it would be our fault. The fault of this generation of these people living in the world now. And yeah, so we should work not to make it a self-fulfilling prophecy, but to put it bluntly. So I'm going to change chat slightly here with, with the questions. Um, we were talking about the impact of running AI models and the compute intensive work of running AI models versus GPU. Um, fundamentally though, when we're running models, we're running it on compute infrastructure and that requires sooner or later a silicon chip discussion. And uh, so one of the questions here is around the relationship between AI and the mining industry, because it seems relevant to the discussion about environmental impacts. Um, and so the commentary here is around, do you have a point of view around, for example, China's growing control over the rare earth metals supply and how that then relates to geopolitical ramifications within the current semiconductor crisis? And so what impact is that going to have on us and AI at a fundamental level? Huge. Uh, I think we see, uh, we, we're seeing a very interesting and problematic and worrying um, phenomenon happening. We thought about the digital for decades as something completely immaterial. And we have overlooked the fact that there are cables, that there are there is silicon, there are superconductors uh, and so on and so forth. And this kind of, Decoupling this kind of division is now converging again. And this conversion is happening, happening in a context of strong geopolitical friction, uh, in a context where, for example, sovereignty uh, is uh, becoming a new pressing element. And I'm afraid that uh, we are, as a society, it's a little bit unprepared to this because we, we've managed to finally deal with the immateriality of the digital. We now have, for example, GDPR in Europe, which deals with data not think about the territoriality of, of the individuals, which is a great you know, step forward conceptually and legally. And we have overlooked the fact that there is all materiality of this, uh, which is loaded with geopolitical implications, and with, but also with global interactions and in, in, in repercussions, because what you produce in China is then used in the US and, and Europe. Uh, and so this is very problematic. And, and uh, I'm sure you, you might have seen the European proposal now for, um, producing chips, cheap in Europe. Uh, and this is a response for uh, the US approach to, to, this other, to this other project, to, this, to the same um, kind of uh, regulation. So uh, I think that, yes, we, we need to, it's worryingly, and I think we, there is need to, more, to get more work there because the geopolitics of this element, the superconductor, the materiality of the digital, so to speak, cannot be dealt with in the way in which we, dealt in the first or the previous century uh, uh, on similar resources, because the implications are much more intertwined globally. So the repercussions will be more severe. More work to be done in this area, stay tuned uh, a few months and perhaps there might be some interesting papers coming out. Great, great. great. So sort of related to this impact on the environment, uh, you made reference to energy. We, we spend a lot of time at Monash University talking about net zero and how do we how do we accomplish net zero and reduce our carbon off uh, carbon footprint? Um, so there's a question here around machine learning itself that often the training that we do for me machine learning itself is not time critical. Uh, running and executing a model might have more time criticality to it, but the training cycle is not necessarily time critical. And so is this an example of something that could make good use of surplus renewable energy? So when the sun is shining or when the wind yeah. is blowing or the hydroelectric is, is operating. And so is, is there a way that we can think about optimizing the style of AI for the style of energy consumption um, and, and again, get to a more optimal equation of how we leverage our resources? 
Yes, indeed. And uh, I think that's a great question. I think that uh, it is possible. And I think it's more than that. We should. And we should by means of governance. And this is where, for example, policymakers and scientists need to sit together and, and, and you know, understand options and go for the most sustainable option. It's something that uh, is important. And not doing it is one of those missed opportunities, which I don't think we can afford anymore. Uh, not, not to sound like too extreme, but uh, these are low hanging fruit, which we're not taking somehow just because there is not the right convergence between those who have the information and those who manage the practices. So yes, indeed, that's a great point. You've mentioned policy a number of times. You mentioned it in your presentation. Of course, you can imagine we've got quite a lot of questions around policy and policy makers. And so the first question here is, do we, do we think policy makers in the climate change space are actually taking notice of these risks that you've outlined? and the implications associated with the use of AI? Or do they simply see AI as a silver bullet and you know your magic wand of it can solve everything? Or are they really understanding and taking seriously the risks and implications? So uh, I can only answer to this thinking about the past 10 years uh, of my experience with policymakers. And now, for example, they become aware over the, the past decade of issues concerning privacy, issues concerning AI. I work a lot in cybersecurity and cyber defense issue concerning the regulation of aggressive uses, aggressive uses of cyber. So there is a, there might be an original naivete in the way this uh, technology is approached. Um, but I, I think, for example, in the European Union, um, uh, while there is this strong focus on the twin transition and the need to leverage the digital for the green or the environment, there is a growing awareness of also having to regulate this area for its own uh, impact. I mean, if it's not about AI, but we're all very aware about the gas, I mean, green gas, uh, greenhouse emissions of data centers. Uh, and so I would be really <laughs> worried and puzzled if a policymaker in this area we're not really aware, if not specifically how much it costs to train a GPT-3 model, but of having a list of sense that this technology has an impact on the environment. So yeah, uh, there is growing awareness, but there is already some substantial awareness there, I would say. Yes, yes. So another another policy <coughs> question um, is, you know, we're, we're probably most of us today in this lecture uh, working remotely, perhaps working in our home office, Many of us for the last 18 months have been working from home, working remotely. As we encounter a world where we're trying to return to work and get back to the workplace, many employers are increasingly using AI to exercise surveillance over employees, including those working remotely. And so do you have reflections on how we develop ethically sound guidelines or regulations around surveillance by employers, and perhaps not just by employers, but surveillance more generally, you, you made reference earlier to perhaps impact on, on individual privacy. But how, how do we address this, particularly as we're entering into hopefully a post-pandemic world, uh, where our experience and thought processes around surveillance and what are we willing to accept as perhaps fundamentally shifted over the last 18 months, but how do we develop or help our policymakers develop those ethically sound guidelines? Yeah, no, this, is a, this is a very important uh, issue, which I'll speak it to the news a few times in, in, in the past month. So it, it, it's a pressing uh, and present risk. Um, I think that any form of surveillance, when we start to characterize it, characterizing it as surveillance, then it becomes problematic. Um, and uh, I think that I'm only, I should say, I only speak about what I know. So I'm, I'm much more of a, uh, informed about European and UK policies. So I won't be able, I'm afraid, to, to comment on, uh, on different corners of the world. But um, in, in Europe as well, that there are, particularly, there are important regulations which limit the way of you can collect data and the way you can use data about people, especially employees, which does not mean that people won't do whatever they are not supposed to be doing. But I think in the question, there is an interesting point, which is that we might have grown accustomed to some form of monitoring. And so we might be conceding too much of our autonomy and privacy uh, without too much friction. Uh, 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 and so that, that is also very problematic because uh, I'm not I'm not convinced when I hear arguments about the, responsibility, the individual responsibility of users with respect to the protection of their own data, because I think 
the, the, the situation is a little bit unbalanced. But I think this makes the situation a bit more problematic because you have a constant pressure of eroding previously and eroding determination. And then the friction becomes a bit weaker from the resistance is a bit weaker from the other side. So I think that we have regulations uh, in place in some corners of the world. Uh, we need to have better ethical practices and ways of checking practices from employees or those who provide technologies. We also need to increase a little bit the awareness um, uh, from the users so that there is a, an extra checking point, so to speak, uh, on, this, uh, on this problem. Thank you, thank you. We're running close to the end of time, so I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions and then we'll start to wrap up for, for today's session, but it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, you made you made early reference in your talk about how important it is for a, a doctor to be able still to be able to understand an X-ray, even if perhaps an AI system is automating and understanding the technology. That, in essence, sort of illustrates that the automation aspects of AI actually result in potentially lower demand for skills in the market, in particular areas and disciplines. And so, what's your point of view on? Should we tax AI to offset social and societal costs of significantly lower demand for that labor associated with that massive rollout of AI? Sort of it's an economic discussion, right? The, the labor force in a particular area goes down. How do, we, how do we then reflect that from an overall economics perspective? Yeah, this is an interesting and very complex feature to, to consider. So generally speaking, I think that the best way of using AI is to delegate to AI tasks and then free human time so that we can devote ourselves to whatever human project, uh, Florida would say, to whatever aspiration we have to improve ourselves as humans. And if we can free people's time and using uh, and tax profit generated by AI to support those people to, to you know, flourish as individuals, ideally, that's a perfect balance, it's the perfect outcome. We also have to make sure not to uh, intervene too strongly in a way that then would hamper technological innovation, which will then hamper the use of AI in those domains. So a trade-off again has to be mm -hmm. has to be reached. I think that I can only answer as an ethicist, and is that the driving criteria for those trade-offs should be environmental and societal uh, well-being and flourishing. So reaching that trade-off in that way would be the ideal solution. But yes, in principle, I mean, it's, uh, in a society which is relying increasingly more on AI to foster and develop economically, taxing outcomes delivered by AI is not unconceivable. Sorry for the double negative. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and then finally, a comment on this, um, in essence, digital divide that you made reference to in terms of developed nations and underdeveloped nations and the ability to access not just technology on which to run models, but also the investment of the workforce and the differences between, for example, North America and, and some other uh, underdeveloped nations that you referenced. From a policy perspective, do we need to think about policy harmonization and use of AI to prevent the abuse of technology in less democratic countries? And so it's sort of a, a combination of, we've got different sides of the world with different approaches to appropriate use of AI. We've got the world with different access to technology. How do we get to a point where we've got a common set of frameworks and use cases that enable us to mitigate those initial five risks that you laid out at the beginning of your presentation? Yeah, this, this is a crucial question because we want to, to, to breach the digital divide in a way that people who don't have access to the opportunity that technologies uh, uh, open up, those people would have access to those opportunities and possibly they don't have to go through the same problems that other societies which have already have access to the technology have gone through the past 10 years. Uh, so it's important that we see the, the bridging of the digital divide as a, as a opening up of opportunities, not a dumping of problems or uh, uh, offloading of issues that as societies uh, in some corners of the world, we, we don't want to deal them, with them anymore. So I think it's important that why access is provided to, to the technology, developing countries or less developed countries have also the chance to drive the adoption and the uptake of those technologies following 
fundamental ethical principles, I would say, a policymaker will say, following the principles, founding their own societies and following their own, uh, their own uh, governance and, and policies approaches. So I think that while there is perhaps a responsibility in some corners of the world to share the technology and share the opportunities, we have to leave the driving of these opportunities to those who are going to use them. It's the only way not to become colonial, not to become paternalistic uh, in, in, in doing so. Um, and then, of course, there are lessons learned that we can share, but uh, uh, up to them to, to drive their own technological transition. I would say. Great. Well, that's a, a great uh, place to wrap up today's discussion. Oh, it's really been delightful to have you join us today, Maria Rosario, and for leading this lecture okay. in, our, in our Manish Prato Dialogue series. It's been wonderful. Uh, for our audience, thank you, so thank, thank you. For our audience, too, thank you for joining us this evening in Australia, in the morning, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we invite all of you to stay engaged with us this year with our upcoming series of events and with the Monash Data Futures Institute. Um, hopefully you've been following us this evening on social media, both on LinkedIn and Twitter. We encourage you to join us and to follow all of our activities. You can also join our mailing list by signing up for our affiliation program through our website. Thank you for joining us. It's really been a wonderful discussion and uh, apologies for not getting to all of the great questions that we had. Um, hopefully we'll be able to follow up and continue this dialogue in future events. And we really look forward to seeing you again in the future. We've got a very interesting and exciting program of events uh, sponsored through the Institute in 2022. And we'd love to see you again. We've got many new people and faces that have shown up for today's event this year. And it's been great to have all of you engaging in today's conversation. Thank you again, Maria Rosaria, for a great event today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And goodbye, everyone. <laughs>